Thank you very much to Robert for the introduction and to ESCO, ESCO for inviting us to um, present our work at this webinar. Um, so this is um, collaborative work um, with colleagues at the Fraser of Allender Institute. So with Kevin Connolly and Rhys Bowage um, and it, with excellent research assistance from um, Kira Crummy and uh, Nicolo Brizelli as well. So this is um, the third project which we've been working on um, for ESCO. And this relates to building a suite of subnational socioeconomic indicators for the UK. So before I begin, let me just um, be clear in what terminology I'm using. So throughout this talk, I'll use the term subnational and regional interchangeably to refer to different spatial areas. So in terms of the UK, there's many different spatial areas which we could be referring to. We could be discussing the four nations of the UK, um, Wales, Scotland, England and Northern Ireland. We could be discussing the 12 ITL1 regions, formerly NATS1. Or we could be considering smaller areas such as local authorities, constituencies and super adequate areas. And the subject of this talk will be these, these smaller areas. I'll be discussing a series of recommendations which we've been putting together um, for our final reports, but the recommendations are very much preliminary, still work in progress, so feedback is very much welcome. So just to give you um, some background context, um, we've had a number of projects which we've worked on for ESCO. So recently we had a paper published considering interregional trade data collection and estimation, where we examined the trade surveys undertaken by the devolved administrations, as well as relevant data collected by the ONS. We'll also be resubmitting some more work. Um, this was also undertaken with the same colleagues and with James Black, um, which analyzed um, how we can produce supply and use and input output tables for the four nations. So after we completed these phases of work, we were commissioned again by ESCO to undertake this scoping study um, to develop a suite of subnational socioeconomic indicators for the UK. So the, the aim of this work is to complement the government statistical service subnational data strategy, and we have a similar target audience in mind, so producers and users of subnational statistics, which of course covers a very, very broad array of people. What's specific and unique to our, this report is that rather than focus on focusing on specific categories of indicators, so health, housing, education, what we want to consider is the challenges associated with building profiles of local areas. So for instance, the ONS say, or indeed one of the developed administrations, they often release statistics according to categories. So we might have a release relating to say health or relating to the labor market. But we, what, what we want to consider is how we can put um, all these indicators together in order to analyze um, local areas in greater detail. We'll also be adopting a four nation perspective. So thinking, thinking in depth as well about what the devolved administrations um, have been doing, what their priorities are and how they might differ. We'll be discussing the challenges, opportunities, and trade-offs. As I said, we'll provide a series of recommendations. The key word here being trade-offs, um, because although um, we might have a very ambitious strategy, in terms of um, actually thinking about how a suite could work, there are going to be trade-offs in terms of, say, timeliness, um, granularity, and so on. So what's currently driving some of the need for subnational indicators in the UK? So we've got current policy trends. So recently we've had um, the, the EU exit, um, we've had the pandemic. Um, so we've had these current events and we've seen some very timely indicators um, being produced. I mentioned the GSS subnational data strategy also recently released. Um, very recently, we had the levelling up report being released, and what I'll be focusing on this is actually the technical annex um, on metrics. But aside from all of these current trends, the need for um, subnational data goes back, you know, quite considerably. So we've got the Allsop review undertaken in 2004, um, and Beans review in, in 2016. So this is by no means necessarily a new issue either. 
So as I mentioned, leveling up the regions is now a key priority. We've seen various pieces of funding um, coming about in 2021. I mentioned the leveling up white paper. And as I said, I'm emphasizing that for us, what was of interest was actually this technical annex on, on metrics. In terms of the statistical services um, subnational data strategy, they outlined three major ambitions and our work complements the first ambition and, and the third. So the first ambition relates to producing more timely, granular and harmonized subnational statistics. And going back to what I said about trade-offs, there is often a trade-off perhaps between timely or granular or harmonized. And, and that's something that I'll, I'll discuss. They also talk about um, disseminating subnational statistics so that users can access this data more easily um, and also so that they receive some guidance about you know, how, how these statistics can be interpreted. As I mentioned, the need for better subnational data, it really goes back some way. Even before leveling up, we had this idea of rebalancing. And one thing that I would like to emphasize is that when we were, we were putting together this report is that we really thought that, of course, while current trends are important, we need to be thinking not only about today's needs, but, but future needs as well. So thinking about what subnational data we require, it shouldn't, these choices may shouldn't be with one very specific um, policy or document in mind. It should be with this kind of holistic, holistic um, overview. So why, why do we need a, perhaps a suite of subnational indicators and what, what are we trying to achieve? What is the purpose? Well, we need to identify the overarching characteristics and dynamics of a given region. So users of, of subnational data, they're often looking at a specific area and they want to develop an impression of what's happening in that area. And this comes back to my, um, what I said about having local area profiles. We want to also be able to identify inequalities within and between different regions. We want to be able to assess the relative needs of different regions. This is crucial when allocating funding. Something that we've been talking about in context of leveling up is certainly okay, how, but how do we do it and how are we going to assess it? So we need to be able to identify the appropriate policy levers and reforms required to reduce inequalities. And we also want to evaluate the efficacy of policies implemented and their impact on socioeconomic outcomes. So it's good to have a broader idea about what the purposes are, because this in turn will inform um, some of our key decisions when we're thinking about how to um, bring together subnational data. So when we were producing our report, what were we thinking about? So what, what kind of were the key discussion points and what were some of the, the different options? So one key issue is how timely should the indicators be? So what frequency should the, the data be at? What level of geographical granularity is required? Um, is, is ITL enough or do we need to look at local authority? Do we need to look at smaller than local authority? What's needed for which context? Do the indicators need to be comparable across the four nations? When do they need to be comparable? When don't they need to be comparable? So having thought about those kind of three preliminary questions, we can then think about which indicators could be included in the suite. So we can appraise what data is available and see whether it fits in with, with the defined timeliness and granularity. Then having considered which indicators could be included in a suite, um, we can then start thinking about how can we minimize issues around measurement, minimize issues around comparability, and start to plug some of the, the, the identified data gaps. We can also begin to think about how this data should be disseminated. One thing that I, it's worth pointing out at this stage, when we think about measurement issues, generally these are issues that are affecting say data on the four nations in a similar way, okay? Whereas with comparability issues, that arises because the data between the four nations may not be comparable. So those are two slightly different, different issues there. So 
when we're thinking about subnational data, how timely does it need to be? And I'm talking about socioeconomic statistics, so that's also going to be another theme in this talk that's going to keep coming up. So the recent academic and policy literature has put considerable emphasis actually on, on high frequency indicators. And with the UK's withdrawal from the EU and with the pandemic, there's been a huge demand for high frequency data. But when we're thinking about socioeconomic data, the timeliness of the indicators need to be aligned with the purpose of the suite. And there's also a trade-off between timeliness and granularity given sample sizes required. So when examining socioeconomic outcomes and structural issues, our, our impression based on conversations we were having is that the low frequency data actually is often fit for a purpose. So despite the need for high frequency indicators, in, in terms of socioeconomic data, low frequency data may be sufficient. So one of our recommendations was that the baseline frequency of any suite is of an annual frequency. And this is often perfectly suitable for analyzing education, health, skills, poverty, slow moving indicators, which take time to influence. However, a subset of indicators certainly should be at a higher frequency, perhaps quarterly or monthly. So when we begin to think about cost of living and affordability, when we begin to think about regional labor markets, then certainly we want to see data at the very least at the quarterly frequency. And this data can also be complemented by statistics which are of a higher frequency. So for example, data on the claimant count, we'll also mention data such as on spending and, and on, um, for example, credit and debit cards. These can be of a higher frequency. And in, in, in the context of crises, we do need some higher frequency indicators. But certainly not all indicators need to be of such a high frequency. What level of geographical granularity is required? So to focus on socioeconomic statistics, we need to focus on small area geographies. So it must be below ITL3 at the very least. And the difficulty comes because we've got the devolved administrations producing data interested in subnational data. We also have UK government departments busy producing sub subnational data. So the key goal of the devolved administrations, understandably, is to support policy making in their respective nation. So their subnational indicators are going to be designed to reflect the specificity of their nation and to support devolved policy making. The indicators will also be designed to align with their specific administrative geography. So it's worth mentioning at this point that there's a distinction between statistical geographies and administrative geographies with the, the latter lines up with the structure of local government. And of course, the structure of local government, it differs across the UK. The ONS on the other hand, needs to support policymaking across the UK when producing statistics. So greater emphasis needs, is placed on comparability of data. And they also need to be able to assess the relative needs of different areas of the UK. So again, comparability is, is more important in this context. The difficulty then is, of course, some loss of specificity, um, some, some loss of applicability to, to the devolved nations. So when thinking about subnational indicators, reconciling these two different sets of needs is key, and collaboration between different um, users is very important. So when thinking about small areas, these were the, some of the key geographies which we considered in our report. Of course, local authorities have been the key target when considering um, leveling up. But there are a number of other geographies which are, which are used, and this is by no means an, an exhaustive list. But certainly when we're thinking about small areas, um, output areas are key. So we can think of these as small building blocks. And this is standardized in terms of Wales and England, slightly different in Scotland where data zones and intermediate zones are used. And again, the situation in Northern Ireland is also slightly different. Based on these super output areas, based on um, 2011 census geography, we can build up 
towards other areas. So for example, the ONS has been um, using travel to work areas for some time. Um, this is of um, very useful when considering le regional labor markets. Um, so this is designed with a specific purpose in mind, specific statistical geography. And then of course, we can consider um, smaller areas in terms of administrative geographies, but you've got differences here as well. You can see differences in terms of Scotland um, with different Westminster constituencies and different constituencies for the Scottish Parliament. So with this in mind, we recommend that the baseline granularity of the seat suite is at the local authority level. And for Northern Ireland, local government districts are of the most relevance. In the Northern Irish case, there's been changes to the number of local government districts fairly recently. So there are issues around the construction of historical time series which should be um, investigated. One thing we would also like to stress is that while local authorities may provide a useful starting point, there can be still be considerable variation in socioeconomic outcomes um, within these um, local authorities. So when we think of poverty, when we think of health, looking at local authorities may not be um, the final answer. So we would also say that all indicators need to be available at a smaller, at a lower geographical level. And this geographical level, it still should make sense in a devolved context. The building block approach, which the ONS has begun to use is also, um, may also provide a way forward. Another issue is whether the indicators need to be comparable across the four nations. Well, what we would recommend is that the suite includes a subset of indicators which are comparable across the four nations and remaining indicators should be equivalent in the sense that they attempt to capture the same characteristic but are not necessarily comparable. Where an indicator where an indicator is included for England, we also feel the same indicator should be available for the devolved nations um, and it should only be admitted um, where it's, it's very, very difficult um, to find equivalent data. And as I said, they need not necessarily be comparable, but they should be broadly capturing the same characteristic. Some cautions should also be used around terminology. So it may be easy to perhaps label indicators which are comparable as the headline indicators and indicators which are not comparable as supporting indicators, but some cautions should um, be used. Headline indicators may not be the best or would be the most representative. So there's, there's a trade-off there as well in the sense that some indicators which are comparable um, may not exactly capture what we wish to. So a broad overview now of indicators which could be included in the suite and, and, and some other issues which arise when we begin to, to consider these factors. So I've, I've stressed throughout that we are considering socioeconomic indicators and part of our report considers current international practice. Canada in particular is a, is a pioneer in terms of um, regional data. And Canada's 10 provinces and three territories regularly produce their own economic indicators and an indication of the of common indicators are included on the slide. So what's interesting about Canada is that it's, it's relatively easy to find um, publications at the provincial at the territorial level, and they do also have these kind of area profiles, but, but at the provincial level, which is still quite high. So in thinking about socioeconomic indicators, actually, what we're doing is actually quite different from, from current international practice. The, the emphasis is slightly different, um, and this will become clear as I discuss which indicators we've been considering. So when we were thinking about indicators which should be included in a socioeconomic suite, we considered quite a wide range of indicators. So we consider key economic indicators, but differently from the Canadian case and other international practice, as well as labor markets, we consider skills, education, 
We also think thought about how education data can be augmented to consider social mobility, income and poverty. So that's quite different from, from what you saw on the previous slide. Housing, health, demography, and rurality. So some of these are indicators you would see in a standard economic suite. Some such as poverty, social mobility, that's when we're starting to think about um, socioeconomic outcomes. We also discussed some other indicators, um, so newer indicators which could be um, included in the suite. Another point to mention is that in general, we've considered, um, we've placed emphasis on considering outcomes rather than inputs. So rather than, for example, considering um, numbers of doctors or say teachers, we focus much more on outcomes, so educational attainment um, and so on. So in terms of key economic indicators, we've actually, there are a fairly limited number which are what we consider purely economic. So the ONS has recently started producing small area GBA estimates and lower super output area data is used as a building block to derive bigger geographical areas. So this is actually quite, quite interesting, this idea of having smaller geographies and which you can build up to the, the area you require. It's important to point out here that comparisons can still be tricky. Um, at the smaller areas, direct comparisons shouldn't be made. Um, the ONS has avoided publishing GVA per head because it's inappropriate to compare areas with high net in or out commuting. Another indicator which is, which is very key when we think about cost of living is inflation. This is an area of ongoing development, but sample sizes are a major barrier um, to producing subnational estimates. Trade is very important from an economic perspective, but less critical when we're thinking about socioeconomic indicators and perhaps not required at the same level of, of granularity. All other indicators I'll consider from a socioeconomic perspective. So when we considered labor markets, we included, um, we found data at the local authority level, at the constituency level as well, on a number of indicators. So on productivity, labor supply, labor demand. Where we differed somewhat from, from um, current presentation of labor markets was in starting to think, for example, about business demographics. So the IDBR, Interdepartmental Departmental Business Register, has a, num has a lot of data on um, businesses. And if we can actually get a, a subnational breakdown by industry, um, this will help us learn a lot about labor demand in a given area. We were also interested in skills mismatch, shortages, and gaps. So again, Less, less coverage here. Um, so these were two, two newer areas which we investigated. So as I said, many labor market statistics are published at a local level and could be directly included. Some would require further development. So as I mentioned, skills mismatch, shortages and gaps. Some data does exist, but it would need to be adapted. So there are a number, there are two different surveys in particular. So one which is for the whole of the UK and excluding Scotland and one which Scotland carries out. We also thought that it would be useful to um, break down business type demography by region and by industry as well. So that's going to be a reoccurring theme. So often we have the breakdown either by region or by industry, sometimes due to issues with sample size. Um, but in order to understand um, fluctuations in labor demand, these are important. These indicators are also important when we want to start um, thinking about the connections between the labor market and education and policy. So when we want to be able to start understanding um, which skills are needed, which skills are there, there are gaps in, this will then feed through to um, decisions around education policy. 
So education is an area which where it's particularly um, tricky to think about subnational data. And that's because each nation has its own distinct education policy and system. Obtaining education indicators that are comparable or even similar across the four nations is extremely challenging. Um, Scotland in particular has a has the particularly different system. So often, for example, when we've been thinking about leveling up, the kinds of indicators that have been used are whether the proportion of people who have no qualifications or who have qualifications above a certain level. Um, but when we were considering this part of the report, we actually drew on um, a report by the Social Mobility Commission, which um, where they build a social mobility index by considering um, quality and attainment across a number of age ranges. So importantly, that was for Great Britain only and Northern Ireland wasn't considered. But generally, these were the, 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 the characteristics they were trying to capture. The leveling up white paper also emphasizes the importance of capturing different stages of education. So although it's useful to certainly have indicators um, which are comparable and which can be used to examine across the UK, really you need this breakdown across ages and you need to capture different stages of education um, to effectively formulate education policy. Another important decision which needs to be taken is whether to focus on all children or whether only on children and youth from disadvantaged backgrounds as for example in this this particular report so when we were investigating we found that there is considerable data on schools but it is a case of of assembling it together so school inspection reports as well as other individual school level data it really provides a rich opportunity um, to develop detailed data sets on education in local areas. So there is actually already quite a lot of data there in the background, not publicly available. This is going to require considerable collaboration um, between the ONS and devolved administrations. Another key question is whether this, this data should be augmented with proxies of disadvantage um, to facilitate analysis of social mobility with free school meals being the, the way in which this is, this is traditionally done. We also consider data on income and poverty. So key to leveling up and social policy, social policy are indicators which reflect earnings, income, benefits, and poverty. And in terms of what data is available, this considerable data on earnings, there's now some high frequency data on employees and pay so from the HMRC pays you earn real time indicators. Data on the claimant count and spending on debit and credit cards capture some short term trends. So generally, in terms of these three categories, we would say that there is data available at the local authority level, sometimes even lower. Poverty is the area in which it's very difficult to 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 get data, which really is a bit more granular. But it's also the area in which it makes much more sense to have data which is at the lower level. So there is now considerable low level data on um, child poverty, fuel poverty, this data on English constituencies, which the ONS has been working on. There's now data on food security through the Family Resource Survey, but this is only available at a higher level. And there are many more indicators which could be considered. So this was the area in which there was less coverage in terms of regularity of um, release and granularity. So as I said, most poverty indicators are at the ITL1 level, with child poverty most developed. Income-based measures of poverty for smaller geographical areas, it's very difficult um, to produce these due to the sample sizes in the, the family resource survey. So here I list a number of indicators um, where data is needed um, across the four nations. And as I said, steps have been taken um, 
towards developing these, but sometimes they're only available for one area of the UK, or they're still not yet available at that, that lower geographical level. So I'll go through the remaining categories a bit more brief, um, briefly. So we also considered um, data on housing. So the leveling up um, white paper metrics has placed emphasis on um, home ownership, whether how many, and also housing stock. We focused a little bit more on affordability and also distinguishing between the social and private um, housing markets. Generally, there's quite a lot of data here at the local authority level or lower, slightly less for, for Northern Ireland. So health, while devolved, doesn't pose the same challenges as education um, because the four nations in general are seeking to capture quite similar concepts. So we listed a number of indicators here. And for example, for healthy life expectancy, it's fairly, it's easy to, to obtain um, comparable data across the nations. Again, for well-being and mental health, there's comparable data across the nations. For some of these other indicators, there are, is some variation in what's available across the, the different countries. Before discussing um, issues around measurement and comparability, I'll discuss demography and rurality. So these are growing increasingly important. We are now starting to talk differently about rural areas, urban areas, towns, cities. This is a, a new trend. Um, which is becoming more important. So there's this notion that different areas um, differ considerably. So tackling inequalities is going to be different depending on the area. In general, obtaining data which relates to demography is not so difficult, but data which relates to rurality, transport connectivity, that poses more of a challenge. So the different nations have um, different classifications of what a rural area is. And in terms of the devolved administrations, there's not quite so much data um, on, on transport connectivity. So there are some other indicators which could be included in the suite which capture upcoming risks. So climate change risk in particular, is an important topic. Um, how could different communities be affected by this? Something else we touch on in our report are composite indicators. So for example, how do you produce these indices of prioritization? So we've mentioned some, some different um, ways in which this can be undertaken. There's also an interest in comparing similar places in the UK. Um, so developing means to, to do this is also important. But let me now discuss um, issues around measurement, comparability and data gaps. So what key challenges do we face in, in actually measuring the subnational data? So what are some of the issues that are going on underneath some of the indicators which I, I discussed in the previous section? Well, when we first think about business data, for business surveys, businesses are sampled from the Interdepartmental Business Register, the IDBR. And historically, data is collected on businesses and e the reporting units are either classified as Great Britain or Northern Ireland. So how do you apportion activity to local units for example, to obtain, say, Scottish exports or Welsh exports, usually some kind of indicator variable is used to, to disaggregate the data. The difficulty, though, is that the local units, so the units, say, in Scotland, may have a different industrial classification to the reporting unit, which might be in England. So one thing which could be undertaken is to instead ask um, GBR used to provide information on the activity of their English, Welsh and Scottish that should read LUs. And when we were undertaking um, our analysis of trade data, that's certainly something that we, we, we saw. 
In terms of other challenges with measurement, there's many different surveys which are used to collect um, economic data. So for example, the living cost and food survey, as I mentioned, there have been issues around um, trying to produce subnational estimates of inflation. And that's because of the limitations in terms of the LCF sample size. We see similar issues with poverty data, again, due to the sample sizes used for the family resource survey. Generally, we have much better, um, well, not better, but more granular labor market data. And that's because of the labor force and annual population survey. And of course, the devolved administrations undertake their own surveys as well. With, for example, in Scotland, Scottish core questions being used um, to produce um, small area estimates. So Scottish core questions is an example where sim the same question is asked across a number of surveys in order to obtain the sample sizes needed um, to produce statistics for small areas. When we're thinking about key challenges in terms of comparability across the four nations, this can arise for a number of reasons. So there may be different definitions around key concepts. So different definitions currently of fuel poverty, different definitions of rurality. There might be a slightly different, year, different policy focus. So a focus on early years attainment, versus a focus on early years attainment amongst the disadvantaged, with the latter having a greater emphasis on social mobility. The devolution of specific policy areas also leads to different, edu different systems. This is incredibly prominent when we think about um, education. And there's also different data collection strategies. So for example, where data is collected from UK-wide surveys, then that's far less um, problematic, whereas when data is um, collected individually um, across the different nations, um, then this can result in, in issues around comparability. So how can we minimize some of these issues? So in terms of minimizing measurement issues, issues relating to apportionment certainly warrant further investigation. So thinking about how do we obtain this information? So it may be advantageous in some cases to ask GBRUs to report on the activity of their regional ILUs. It may also be advantageous to classify an RU according to the dominant activity across their regional LUs. So this is very case specific and it will depend on the, the survey as well. Sample sizes continue to be an issue which comes back regularly. So issues around sample sizes can be minimized if the ONS and the devolved administrations collaboratively identify areas in which a sample boost would be mutually beneficial. So currently the ONS is working on um, developing measures of CPI in Northern Ireland, for example. Another thing which can, can help um, obtain the, the sample sizes required is to deploy surveys, is when the ONS and the developed administrations de deploy surveys which can be harmonized or include a subset of harmonized questions. Another thing we would recommend is that when definitions or where the policy focus differs across the four nation, that we actually break the data down according to characteristics and seek to capture constituent parts. So for example, rather than using a proxy for rurality, it makes sense to instead collect data on population density across the four nations and transport connectivity. So if you can break down the concept a bit more, um, then it, it becomes easier um, to obtain comparable data. So in terms of our initial reflections on key regional data gaps, we've outlined around six here. So consumer prices seems key in terms of understanding the cost of living. Um, so producing subnational estimates would be particularly beneficial there. Also um, data on poverty at a lower level would be very useful. Skill shortages 
and mismatch in education, areas in which there is data, but more could be um, built on, transport connectivity, there remains gaps in terms of the devolved administrations, and also business demography by industry in order to understand these fluctuations in, in labour demand. So a bit more information on all of these, these points here. So again, as I mentioned, sample sizes posing challenges. Sometimes the data is available, but not quite for the, the smaller areas required. Standardization required in terms of the, the statistics produced by different nations. Education, as I said, an area where considerable collaboration will be needed and so on. Another thing which could be explored is that data used to capture different med dimensions of the indices of multiple deprivation across the, de the four nations could also be explored. So a final point before I, I begin to conclude should, so how should the data actually by, be disseminated? So as I've mentioned throughout the talk, the majority of subnational statistics are published according to category rather than geographical area. One important exception, and this is not the only exception with the devolved administrations also um, producing their own um, dashboards. One exception is NOMIS, which provides ONS labor market statistics for area profiles. So we would recommend that this service is published publicized much more widely and that extensions to the service are also considered. So to include, for example, statistics on small areas in Northern Ireland, statistics on devolved constituencies. Ultimately though, NOMIS or indeed um, some of the new work being undertaken by the ONS could perhaps provide area profiles on a wide range of indicators. Some consideration also needs to be given to how to guide users so that compared comparisons across areas are only made where appropriate. So basically, this is a summary of some of the, the key th things that have come out of the talk. How timely should the indicators be? So we're suggesting annual with a subset to higher frequency. Which level of geographical granularity is required? local authority for Great Britain, local government districts for Northern Ireland, but this can mask considerable variation in large local authorities. So lower level geographies, which are meaningful in a devolved context should also be considered. Which indicator should be included in the suite? Well, we included a, a wide range with an emphasis on socioeconomic as opposed to purely economic data. Do indicators need to be comparable across the four nations? No, not all indicators need to be. A subset should be comparable with others equivalent and caution should be exerted when referring to a comparable headline and remaining supporting indicators because that the headline indicators are not necessarily um, the best indicators in that instance. How can measurement issues, comparability issues and data gaps be minimized? Well, issues around apportionment and disaggregation need to be considered. Areas should be identified in which the ONS and devolved administrations can collaborate to boost and harmonize surveys. Where, where definitions differ across the four nations should seek to use indicators which capture constituents' parts. We also identified a number of key data gaps. And in terms of dissemination, we stress the importance of local area profiles and the guidance that users will need in order to make valid comparisons. So thank you very much for listening to this talk. Um, I'm very happy to take questions and to even hear any feedback and comments as well. Okay, thank you, Sharada, for a very nice talk. Uh, okay, so we'll start the, the question and answer. So um, before uh, you, uh, you, you, uh, before you ask your question, please remember to give your name and affiliation again. Okay, so uh, the first um, question is from Thomas Newton.
well, if he's not, if Thomas isn't able to ask it verbally, I can read it out. Uh, but but let's come back to that in a moment. So, okay, let's try next. Uh, I mean, I'll read it if necessary. So, uh, Jacqueline Collier Dixon. Okay, it also doesn't seem to be working. Uh, well, okay, let me read the questions then. If, if in the meantime, if we can figure this out, and uh, then otherwise, we, yeah, okay. So the first question from Thomas Newton says, what is the reason for not considering transport as a separate category of socioeconomic indicator alongside health and housing and skills? It strikes me quality of transport is a key factor in determining social inclusion, quality of life and inequalities, as is recognized in the LUWP. There is also a huge amount of data available, although of, of varying quality. So thank you, Thomas, for that question. So obviously when we were undertaking the report, I think there are literally hundreds of indicators we could consider. So we considered um, transport connectivity within the context of um, demography and rurality. And we were thinking in terms of um, in terms of some of the indicators that had been used, for example, to develop indices of prioritization. And in terms of those indices, um, data on transport connectivity, there wasn't sufficient data on Scotland and Wales. So that was the point that we've pointed out um, in terms of the report, but certainly that's something that we could um, reflect on um, going forward, thinking about how quality of transport um, fits in perhaps as a separate issue, which can't completely be considered in the context of demographics and rurality. Uh, Robert, you are on mute. Thank you. We seem to be having an issue, but uh, the the, um, the participants can't so they aren't able to. Uh, I mean, they're un unable to unmute them at the moment. Okay. It seems, but uh, well, let me try again. Just see if, uh, if Jacqueline Collier Dixon, are you able to unmute? And if not, I'll read your question. Hi, Robert. Please read her question. She's unable okay. to unmute. Okay. Okay. Right. I'll read it. So uh, the question is this. Uh, Interesting with the rural urban classification, is there anything possible on seasonality? Some areas are very seasonal in their income, such as Norfolk, uh, relying on agriculture and tourism. That's a really interesting issue. So I think one thing in terms of the timeliness of the suite, we've been thinking of data at the annual frequency. So of course, all that seasonality um, disappears from the data. Um, but when thinking about higher frequency statistics, then seasonality um, becomes an issue. So I think that is something that we could um, take a note of um, going forward as we as we um, produce the final report. Okay, so the next question is uh, uh, from Angel Angelica uh, Bardalai. Now, if you're able to ask, ask the question, just chip in, otherwise I'll read it. Uh, and it is this, on the issue of timeliness, and also given the, the limitations of the survey approach that you, are flag that you flagged, to what extent are you considering incorporating alternative data sources into the suite? Uh, brackets, where is huge demand for data at a high frequency, uh, at a higher frequency than annually? Mm. I think that certainly a subset of indicators could be um, a, a higher frequency. And I think this would obviously involve using um, different methods. So for example, even when I think about prices, data things, techniques such as web scraping and so on. But really what we were thinking was, what are the indicators which would make up the core of the suite? And it is, while it is definitely true um, that there's a huge demand for data, at a higher frequency, I do think it is still appropriate um, for certain categories such as 
as I said, education, poverty, and so on, um, to use lower frequency indicators. I think what the question is about identifying um, the categories of indicators where higher frequency data would be needed and therefore where um, non-survey based approaches um, would be relevant. So I think, I think it's maybe about capturing um, the which categories um, where that, that higher frequency data is needed. Thank you. Hi. Can you can you actually hear me? This is Angela. Yes. Speaking. Hi, oh, Jen. Brilliant. Um, so we've we've got the the technology going, and I was able to unmute. Um, well, just to say thank you very much for the presentation. Um, this is extremely extremely topical, and um, just just to follow up to your response to my to my question. Um, when you talk about, you know, identifying the indicators where it would be more or less appropriate to consider something, um, you know, higher higher frequency uh, than than annual, is the consideration primarily around, you know, the robustness of of the data and what one might be able to to do at a at a higher frequency, or is the consideration more that, you know, because what we're considering here is socioeconomic indicators, you feel that um, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be valuable in some cases because some socioeconomic indicators, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, educational poverty, you think may not show um, lots of change mm. at higher frequencies. Or is That's it both? True. I think it's more the latter. I think it's in the sense of thinking very hard about the purpose of the suite. Um, so because the emphasis is on socioeconomic indicators and it's meeting specific needs, I think that's why um, we haven't focused so much on high frequency data. And it's definitely true that from a policy perspective, there is a, there's a lot of space to be thinking about high frequency indicators and also um, using um, different methods um, and, you know, using more innovative data sources. But in a sense, uh, this is about thinking about um, socioeconomic indicators and actually a lot of the survey data is actually okay um, and an annual frequency it actually fulfills that that purpose I think. Okay that that makes sense and you're you're still comfortable broadly speaking with the survey based approach given the challenges that you mentioned around you know um, participation and sample size. And so on. Yes I mean I think there are I would say that the focus of the report was not so much on using um, alternative techniques uh, to, to uh, produce the data, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're, we would say the survey approach is always best. And maybe that's something we should actually be clear on. I mean, where, where data gap can be plugged in a different way, um, it might not always be about say boosting sample sizes and so on, because I think that can only go so far as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Sherada, I have a question as well, which is uh, um, this. Okay, you can distinguish on the one hand between uh, um, trying to find all the data that's already, or useful data that already exists and collecting mm -hmm. it uh, and making better use of it versus uh, requesting new types of data that maybe are not being collected at the moment. Now, I was just wondering, mm -hmm. could you say something about it with your, this, your project here, you know, how, how, how much of it is one and how much of it is the other here? In yeah. Terms of your objective? Yeah, I think certainly the idea is much more to assess what we have. Um, what, what do we currently have and, and how can we build this suite to meet the needs and quite often it is a case of it's not that often that completely an indicator is not available so I'd only say I'd say for example consumer prices that is an example of an indicator which is not available at the subnational level and it is very challenging to produce it at a subnational level using current survey techniques without boosting sample sizes quite a bit um, but in general, we have been focusing more on what indicators are actually already out there. Um, and it's more about putting them all together and what, what picture we're trying to, to also develop, I think. I think the, the reflections are also on these issues of comparability and trying to minimize them uh, rather than going out there and collecting lots of um, brand new data using different methods. 
So does that clarify, Robert? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here uh, from uh, Jagdev Singh uh, Sin Verdi. Do, are you able to answer that? To ask that question yourself? Let's see if you're able to. Okay, probably not from the looks of things. So, if if you're able to, just just come in when you can. But I'll read the question. Uh, okay, so it says, uh, "Well, I welcome the overall approach. Um, some observations." Can small area estimation methods be used to fill to fill some gaps? There, there are five points here. So point two for England, when when you say local authority as building blocks, can we assume lower level, um, e.g., districts and not counties? Uh, three, alongside GVA, do do you propose making available hours worked at all uh, geographies? so that productivity can be calculated for bespoke geographies. Four, on dissemination, ONS and the neighborhood statistics facility, which easily provides area profiles. I oh, sorry, had the, uh, which, sorry, on dissemination, ONS had the neighborhood statistics facility, which easily provided area profiles. When it was stopped, a replacement was supposed to be developed, but it, it but is still awaited. Can this also be prioritized? And finally, uh, five. I didn't see the crime. I didn't see crime mentioned in the list, but should be considered. Thank you. Okay. Thanks to Dave for his question. So this is quite a good number of points. So I agree on the crime points that crime should be mentioned, but isn't currently considered because it is definitely um, one area in which we we haven't pulled anything together as yet. But I, I agree that it feel it, it falls in line with um, the other indicators we're trying to consider. Um, on dissemination, then that's a useful point about the neighborhood statistics facility, and that's certainly something we can we can look into. Um, on the question of building blocks, I think what I was referring to was the ONS's recent approach in terms of using output areas as building blocks. So when I say using building blocks, I don't mean building on using the local authority level as a building block. I would suggest using output areas um, as a building block for some statistics. In uh, terms of... Oh, sorry. Go, go on. Sorry. No, sorry. no, it's OK, Robert. Sure. No, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say but one, one other thing that's uh, crossed my mind is uh, one useful statistic, which I, I don't think you I don't think you've covered this, at least, uh, is energy performance certificates. That would be uh, I mean, it'd be useful in two regards. One is in terms of climate uh, angle. I'm thinking here for energy performance certificates for residential housing but also potentially in a leveling up context as well, if it turns out poor areas have lower energy efficiency. Now, the problem at the moment is, as I understand it, that good data is available for England and Wales, but I don't think that's the case in Northern Ireland and Scotland. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so, so again, this might be coming more into a kind of wish list direction that, that could, um, that maybe a, a plea could be put in to, to, um, to have to try and get better data for Scotland and Northern Ireland on energy performance certificates for, for residential housing. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, I think, I think certainly in terms of the climate indicators, it's more an area which we feel is important, but we haven't covered in detail. And I, I think as a general comment, based on all the comments that are coming through. Um, it's really useful um, to, to have all the comments. I think the difficulty in, in um, approaching this area is just the sheer number of indicators you could possibly consider. Um, and I think what we've tried to do in the report is try and pull through um, broad trends and broad areas um, and have that more holistic way of thinking I think that that's some of the, the value added that we're hoping to bring um, because it is quite easy to focus in on one indicator and then then um, delve very deeply into it. But um, yes, I'll definitely be keeping a track of all the, the questions posed and where I haven't fleshed out more deeply than it's something that, that we can investigate further when we're finishing the report. 
Yes, now I realize, yes, your scope is more general. You can't go in, into this report. You can't go into every detail, yes, for sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, well, I think that's everything for, for today then. So uh, uh, be, be, just before we go, uh, let me just say that um, next the next seminar uh, in two weeks time, so on 10th of March, will be Local Variations in the Labour Market Impact of COVID-19 by, by Jessica Hug of ESCO. Uh, so uh, that aside, uh, uh, I would just like to thank you, Sharada, for a very interesting talk uh, and given us all plenty to think about as to how, how uh, uh, you know, statistics, particularly at the, the disaggregated granular level, should be structured. So thank you very much. Thank you.